Today we're going to talk about um, uh, what most people imagine to be a mining problem or a resource problem or an investment issue, and none of that is true. Um, as the introduction has said, uh, we're going to talk about uh, geopolitical issues. Uh, everything we're going to talk about is, is geopolitical in nature. None of it is economic. Um, when I say China front-loaded the downstream side of the value chain, uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about hinges on that. And what that means is that the Chinese government made tremendous investments in the downstream side of the value chain far in excess of global demand. And the reason they did that is because that available capacity with no capital or investor return requirements or profit requirements is standing and ready to process these materials at costs that no other country or company could compete with. So keep that in mind as we move forward. It's a pretty aggressive schedule. We, we may not get through it. Uh, if somebody can tell me, uh, give me, um, flash me when we're when we so we have about 25 minutes for questions uh you, you really got to get my attention because i'll keep going um so uh the 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 reason i say china's history of ascent and ascendance is really important they not only uh climbed quickly up to the top of uh of the uh the value chain for the production of all these critical materials but they're now in ascendance. When I say ascendance, they're in a very dominant and controlling position from a geopolitical standpoint. And it's not just rare earths, it's essentially all of the critical materials. We're gonna cover that, we're gonna cover how it happened. Uh, and then finally, if we get that far, we'll talk about how we can potentially fix it. So, little history, everything starts with history. Um, the greatest miracle, economic miracle, and human history uh, occurred over the last 40 years, and it was almost exclusively made possible through U.S. Cold War policies that promoted U.S. companies uh, uh, going to China and helping them do things, right? So this was a government-sponsored technology transfer program that was geopolitically based on offsetting uh, uh, the, the, what we consider at that time as a Russian threat. So this, uh, this great colossus that we face is of our own making. So how do we undo that? Um, so what we've done for the past 20 years is we've tried to address this issue through standard capitalist free market solutions, off-the-shelf solutions that our politicians uh, are, are uh, at risk of not promoting, they have to believe and promote these things, that the free market solves every problem, capitalism always wins, but in fact, that is not true. I, I would go so far as to say, that game is over. So, what is the primary driver for China? China's primary drive is, uh, it has nothing to do with profits, return to investors, uh, no, nothing like that at all. Its primary goal is to enhance its geopolitical power. Uh, secondarily, employ as many people as possible because that's how they stabilize their government. But at the end of the day, all of China's motivations are completely divorced from standard economics. So we can't solve this problem with the, re the regular tools in the regular toolbox. Now, Congress is fully aware of this, and I'll show you they were fully aware of this. The problem is they unleashed uh, uh, a, uh, the political, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the financial greed of, of uh, profiteers. That would be the entire finance industry, uh, publicly traded companies, legacy technology companies. And they did this uh, while pursuing their Cold War policy. And uh, the these... These uh, legacy uh, corporations, uh, these financial markets had so much political power, you could not put that cat back in that bag. So how do we know this is true? Well, there's something called the Cox Report. And the, and the Cox Report detailed, it, it, if anybody's got time to read a 900-page document, which I did, uh, it's a very enlightening. Um, 
Things that you hear about today in the news where they say, oh, there's this Chinese strategy for doing this or for doing that. All of it was spelled out in explicit detail uh, in this report. This report was widely ignored, in fact, universally ignored, because again, why the, uh, they had unleashed uh, the, uh, uh, the profit motive of legacy capital, and those people were so busy making fortunes and offshoring uh, our capital and our industry and our technologies to China that there's just no way to stop them. So uh, let's talk about the ideological difference uh, uh, of the United States versus China, where um, we continue to believe uh, that you know they're going to be they're going to follow the same rules we follow. Well, that's that is not true according to the four highest ranking people in the Chinese government and uh, around this time period, reaffirming the position of Deng Xiaoping in 1978, which is all things economic and commercial are intertwined with our geopolitical aspirations, with our military aspirations. That's true, and to some degree that was true for the United States. Uh, not so much anymore. So. Um, we're going to talk about what happened when the United States essentially took decades and even centuries of, of know-how and IP and capital and transferred it into an economy uh, where um, a billion people were living in, in, in measurable abstract poverty. This is, this is the results. Uh, if you actually look at the graph and, you, and you're kind of fair, it was basically flatline until Deng Xiaoping, and then those growth rates, no one anywhere has ever achieved those kinds of growth rates. And if you look at the little graphics, it all kind of starts there when Richard Nixon's shaking uh, Mao's hands. Uh, this, is, this was the, uh, the, the geopolitical strategy of the United States to decouple China, pull them into our orbit and away from Russia. Uh, it was probably a reasonably good strategy at the time. Nobody ever... Uh, bothered to put brakes on that bus, and that bus just kept going until it went off a cliff. So uh, let's look at some more stuff. So uh, how many people, raise your hands, have ever heard of uh, uh, Made in China 2025? Oh, boy. That's bad. So uh, Made in China 2025, which is uh, achieved uh, through a highly subsidized uh, government investment and acquisition, illicit and any other and every other means, to take over the the primary high value industries of today and tomorrow. And you know, for anybody thinking, uh, you know, uh, they're they're Milton Friedman light flashing in their head that that's bad and no one should do that. That is completely untrue. The entire U.S. economic history was built on exactly that model. And so I have a reference later on in the document, and I invite you to read. So what is China made in 2025? It's essentially China targeting all these uh, high-value industries, and they their goal is to displace uh, um, the Europeans, the Americans, Korea, Japan, from these markets and leave them to less dignified markets, primarily supplying their market on the lower end of the value chain. Um, so that's pretty scary. This is a little scarier. There's something called uh, um, One Belt, One Road. Hands? Well, a lot better, excellent. Uh, what is that uh, strategy? That strategy is the strategy that the United States followed for a number of centuries which is to centrally go out to resource-rich countries, provide them uh, uh, access to financing and uh, improvements in infrastructure, load them down with debt, and use that as a tool to leverage uh, the economic advantage of the most generous country. Uh, China is doing that with great success. Uh, and um, this is how they essentially are able to go into countries and uh, maximize or monopolize supply chains of critical materials, um, and it's quite effective. Here's another one, string of pearls. Uh, any hands? Okay, same folks, very good. This is a geopolitical strategy, uh, which is China is already moving to uh, uh, encapsulate 
India's development while enhancing their own. Um, so uh, this is, uh, if you think about both of these programs, they amount to a modern day Marshall Plan, right? And uh, that's, uh, that is happening now and today, and we're not participating in it. And so how effective is it? Well, these are measures of the money and where it's invested around the world. In the um, One Belt, One Road String of Pearls program, mostly One Belt, One Road, as you can see, Africa, which is a very resource-rich country, gets the largest investment. And how effective is that? That's pretty effective. I want you to think about that. That is a very short term. Look at the shift in trade patterns in the world. Nobody's telling you this on the nightly news, strangely. How effective is it, let's say, in Africa? Africa likes carrots, they don't like sticks. The United States shows up to the party usually with sticks. We ran out of carrots, apparently. So that's how it's working there. That's how it's working everywhere. So uh, down below, lots of sources for you to confirm that our entire successful economic development as a country was largely on industrial policy. Uh, what are we going to talk about next? What are tech metals? Tech metals are the boxes in red, uh, the uh, boxes in, um, that are surrounded in gold. Those are like the super tech metals. Uh, there's roughly 100 uh, uh, natural occurring elements on the periodic table. And this little handful uh, are what's going to drive the world of the future. So, you know, if they were super abundant, it wouldn't be a problem, but they're not. This is the elemental makeup of the entire planet, not the atmosphere, the planet. And if you look at that tiny, tiny wedge at the top, that is collectively more than all of the critical materials we're talking about. So uh, you're talking about trying to harvest a very, very small fraction of materials that are generally tied up very, uh, in, in, in very strong bonds with other materials. It's a uh, it's very expensive uh, uh, process. Um, let's look at it on a, uh, uh, a, an atomic level of availability. Down there in the gold section, that is the, uh, the noble metals, the precious metals, platinum and gold. If you look at rare earths, um, it's not like they're not abundant, but they're just in nature. They're not, uh, they're not easy to get to. Uh, they tend to be uh, in very few deposits in concentrations that are high enough to be economic. Uh, and then what's really interesting is the heavier they get, the, the more scarce they are. And also, correspondingly, uh, their uh, chemical... Uh, physio physical attributes uh, uh, become uh, very enhanced. So, for example, lutetium has the highest magnetic moment of any element on the periodic table, and it is super hard to get. It's super rare. So, um, that just, and then all the other critical materials are, are marked in red. But you can see, in terms of abundance, like lithium is super abundant, right? Think about it. There's a lot of lithium compared to all the other elements. The problem is it's, very dilute in seawater, right? So it doesn't really do you a lot of good. It's, uh, you know, to, to, um, to get it into a chemical, into a, uh, to find it in a concentration level that's economic, uh, um, and then tied up um, geochemically in a way that it's easy to separate uh, is, is very difficult. Most of the good uh, lithium deposits are in South America. Uh, uh, the we have lithium here, but it's usually in a hard rock environment, which is not real economic. It's just very, very difficult. So let's think about these things in terms that people understand. So uh, iron, steel, the most commonly used industrial uh, metal. And if you think about it, that little circle is all the critical uh, uh, materials. And if you if you think about it, they collectively make just about 1.3 of one of those bricks that makes up that, that large block. And um, so um, these are very, very tiny markets. I mean, they're microscopic compared to, 
to steal. Um, so um, this is a problem. Uh, uh, another problem is that copper, which nobody really talks about, is going to be uh, one day, suddenly people will realize that it is going to be one of the uh, Strength, one of the choke points in this green technology environment. The amount of copper that's available from a resource standpoint is very limited. All the good deposits have been long since mined. The new deposits you find have much, much lower concentrations of copper, which means much higher prices of extraction. Uh, copper mining is not a clean business. Uh, there is a lot of environmental pushback. And so uh, copper is going to end up being... Um, uh, a pseudo uh, critical material, but in fact, it is a very critical material. So um, let's look at uh, green technologies and what uh, metals they need. Uh, as you can see, electric vehicles need a lot. They need they need a disproportionately large number of critical materials. So um, let's think about uh, uh, where we get those critical materials. This is an old graphic. I apologize. It's the only one I can find. This shows who, what countries are mining what. And I want you to point out that, uh, that for cobalt, you might notice that China doesn't mine any cobalt. But China refines about 85% of the world's cobalt, right? So you don't need to mine it to control it. Um, and, um, you know, so for example, um, Graphite's another one. China has does some uh, graphite mining, but in some instances for very specific applications, let's say an electric vehicle, China controls 100% of the world's spherical graphite production. So, so these are these are problems, right? Um, we're going to get into the rare earths, and that's a whole problem in its own. Why can't we? Uh, what are the informational problems from a policy standpoint? So this is a USGS graph. They call it a tornado graph. And they try to uh, help uh, policymakers understand resource risk. And so according to this, I don't know, you have like 15 elements or minerals that we're 100% import dependent on. You know, so, hey, you know, that's not too bad. Is that manageable? You know, what do we do about it? It's not good information because... Nobody takes minerals out of a mine and puts them into an F-35. They go through a whole series of very, very complicated and expensive processes before they can be used in applications. So what they should be measuring in addition to that would be downstream value add. So same graphic, and what I'm showing here is China's control over the downstream process to the point of application. And when I say point of application, it is a, an alloy or a magnet that gets put on or in something. So this is China's controlling position when you measure for the downstream. Let's look at it another way. The top graphic shows where it's mined. The lower graphic shows where it's refined. And that's not even to the point of application. That's just the mid-level in the value chain. So that looks problematic. Well, here's the next graphic. This is where it's actually turned into something at the point of application. So if you look at this graphic, what you notice that I point out on the side, 95% of all rare earth value for all the rare earths in the world are in a metallic form. Now, who's doing all of that work? And the work that is not being done in the United States or Japan or someplace else, still is 100% reliant on China for various inputs to make the, the chemical alloy uh, uh, um, uh, desired um, chemistry for that magnet. So in other words, China actually indirectly controls 100% of production directly or indirectly. Um, so, there, if you look at refining, they do about 85% of the world's refining. And um, the refining 
of rare earths. This is basically powders you can't yet use in anything. Actually contains about 90% of all rare earth value. Okay, so when you go from refined powders that are halfway through the value chain, there's 90% of all uh, value attributable to rare earths is right there. And when you take the step further to make the metallics where these things can actually be used, and there's only a 5% increase in value, that should set off an alarm in your head. That is a, a very, very strong signal that is universally ignored in this problem, and that is... China subsidizes that transition to the extent that it's below anybody's cost. You can't take rare earth oxides and make super alloys and only add 5% cost. Nobody can do it at that price. So why are they doing it at that price? Because that is actually the, full, the tip of the fulcrum of all of their leverage in this monopoly is right there in metallics. No one can make the metallics without them, right? Because at the end of the day, you have to get your terbium and dysprosium from them, and we'll talk about why that's important soon. So I threw out a challenge earlier to some folks about their careers in engineering and uh, how this uh, graphic may influence how they view the world. Um, this graphic says that if the United States is going to hit the 50% uh, production goals of 2030, this is how much more mining needs to happen. Now, in the United States, I can tell you definitively those are impossible numbers because the United States has only opened five mines in the last 20 years, and one of those mines had 30 years' worth of permitting engineering into it before it opened. We can't open that many mines in the 10 years or even 20 years or even 30 years, but there is a country who can. Anybody want to guess what that country is? There you go. Just keep repeating that. You do, you do very well on the test. So, so in fact, U.S. policy to race forward and develop EVs and all of these other green applications is not an economic benefit to the United States. It's the opposite of that. It is a very, very strong, uh, it very, very much strengthens China's geopolitical uh, position vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis every other country, because no one can respond like that. Who does respond that, that quickly? Countries like Myanmar, right? All part of the One Belt, One Road system. They can respond because from an environmental standpoint, they make the Chinese look like, uh, I don't know, uh, the Sierra Group, Sierra Club. I mean, so, so think about this. Think about this, this, this race, this... this um, this field of dreams moment where we're just, we just say it's going to happen. It's not just going to happen, not the way we want. So um, anyway, exploring China's dominance in rare earths. We're finally getting to rare earths. Let's put things in proportions folks can understand. China builds cities the way America used to build cities. There is a little place called Gary, Indiana. And Gary, Indiana, literally was nothing until the guy named Gary said, we're going to put a steel mill there. And then it became the greatest producer of steel in the world. And everything was built around the steel mill, including the churches, the firehouses, and the homes. So China still does business. There are two cities in China with a combined population of about 17 million people. The guy who delivers, uh, you know, um, Food, the guy who, you know, does laundry, directly or indirectly, every one of them is involved in the production and advancement of China's rare earth sector. If you want to put that in, 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 in uh, Cold War or war proportions, that would be 15 times the size of the U.S. Manhattan Project. At the peak of the Manhattan Project, not far from where you guys are right now, there was about 100,000 people working in secret to build uh, a, a device. Let's call it a device. Anyway, so, um, so what are the drivers in this? Right, let's talk comparative politics. The last four most 
the last four leaders of the Chinese government all directly were involved in promoting the rare earth sector. This is some crazy stuff that literally uh, some of this was published. And then when you go back and try to find the publications, they have been removed, uh, not because they were wrong. Um, but two of uh, the premier leaders of China had direct family investments in the space. Deng Xiaoping successfully acquired the sole producer of rare earth magnets for our uh, NDFEB magnets for our military uh, for the low, low price of $70 million. And f later the asset was flipped for $1.3 billion. And the current head of state uh, had uh, about $400 million of direct investment into rare earth value chain uh, investments. Now, I mean, just imagine a world where a president had a, uh, a, a an investment in, in an industry like, let's say, oil. I mean, how would that how would that ever influence our policy, right? So uh, that's the difference. They are talking. They these people were making uh, had had political, ideological, and, and geopolitical investment in the future. Oil is a uh, is a energy asset of the past. So um, you got to be you got to know which way you're looking before you start walking. And apparently we're walking backwards. So um, comparative again in terms of commitment, government commitment. When I say that the United States has one national lab that works on rare earths, that is a wild exaggeration. The Ames Laboratory. Uh, it would be a wild mischaracterization to say that they were committed to rare earths. They were committed to whatever was budgeted. And so for the majority of its existence, essentially nothing but background work was being done. At the same time, China built the equivalent of five national laboratories that had one purpose and one purpose only, advancing the uh, the future of that industry and their geopolitical position in that industry. In fact, what's crazy is that in 1985, by 1985, China had built the world's largest rare earth research facility in the entire world yawned. You know where I found that? I found that in a publication from Ames Laboratory, and it was about six sentences long and it didn't draw any attention or even consider the, the consequences of it. So this is the difference of, and level of commitment. Now let's start thinking about things in, let's say, academic terms. Everybody thinks we're up there leading the world, but, uh, you know, there's uh, 1.3 billion of them, and I would suggest that a large portion of those folks are highly, highly motivated to find a place in the world. And consequently, uh, they are outpacing us in, in scientific literature. In science, science, nobody cares about that. Well, how about this? How about this? Filed patents. China's first patent was in 1983. U.S. patents go back to 1950. By, 1970, ni by 1997, China had surpassed the United States. And today, right now, based on the, the regular growth rate, China has more patents than rare earth patents than the rest of the world combined. China is filing a rare earth, 35 rare earth patents for every one we file here. Commitment. Well, let's talk about resources. Everybody wants to pretend this is all about mining. This is a very misleading graph because... The only one that is not going to China is the little short purple one. Another way to look at it, the small diagram is what they tell people in Congress is going on. The big diagram is the truth. Even some of what comes out of Australia still goes through, through China. In fact, the high value stuff, all the high value stuff does go through China. Let's get back to this issue. My favorite thing, you guys will all know this in a trivial pursuit that will never happen. Only four rare earths are 90% of the value. That is where all of the uh, magnets come from. And um, 
What's interesting is that in a natural distribution in the ground, uh, the proportionality of rare earths tends to be those first two, cerium and lanthanum. So if you looked at global production and you measured the proportions by each individual rare earth, cerium and lanthanum would be about 80%. And cerium and lanthanum actually has a negative value. It costs more to separate and refine cerium and lanthanum than you can sell it for. And it's not by a small margin. It's by a very, very large margin. It costs about $10 to refine and separate a rare earth. And uh, cerium and lanthanum both trade for about a buck 25. So for the Mountain Pass Mine in California, bragging that they produce 15% of the world's rare earths, it's 83% cerium and lanthanum. So in fact, they're not producing anything near that. Their contribution is de minimis. Um, so anyway, you go from 90% in value for those four to 95 in metallics. And the reason that increase is so small is because that is exactly where China has its monopoly. We're going to cover this point one more time. Who makes the metals? China does. But all those guys struggling on the bottom, they are still 100% reliant on China if they want to make a high temperature magnet. If they want to make a magnet be used in a weapon system or an electric vehicle, they still need to get their terbium and dysprosium from China. This is a lot. This should be read later. The point is, again, China's dominance on the downstream. Again, this is a lot. The point is, they show you where it's mined, but in the end, where does it all go to? Where everything passes through the same area. And for heavy rare earths, terbium and dysprosium, China has an absolute monopoly on those separated materials. So no one can build a high temperature rare earth magnet without China's uh, direct assistance. They can withhold that at any time. Again, where is it all happening? Where is all the value? And the, the thing you need to understand is China controls terbium and dysprosium. And without terbium and dysprosium, you can't make a high temperature magnet. And I said that three times. Why is that important? If you want brakes on your electric vehicle and they're actuated with rare earth magnets, after you use those brakes for about a week, you will degrade the, uh, the uh, strength of the magnet to the point where you will not have brakes. That's the same for wind turbines and that's the same for weapon systems. You cannot put a regular uh, NDFEB magnet in an environment where temperatures go, can, can go over 80 degrees and if you do, the, the magnet rap rapidly loses its, its strength, and uh, you'll have failure. And the only way to fix that is doping them with terbium and dysprosium. There are some other secret formulas, but they're even more, they're, uh, they're, they're really tough. But China controls all that, and we're going to talk about why China controls all that in a little bit. Yep, in fact, we're going to talk about why it happened so fast and so complete. So here is the story. Um, before 1980, Japan, France, and the United States led the world in rare earths. In every sector and everything, all the way down to metallics. Something changed in 1980. The NRC, the, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the IAEA, which is the world governing body for uh, 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 nuclear, they changed the definition of source material, nuclear source material. And the definition is based on proven nuclear fuels, and there are three proven nuclear fuels to run a nuclear reactor off for civilian power. Thorium, uranium, plutonium. Now, the same is not true for weapons, a device. You cannot make a weapon, a nuclear weapon, a bomb with thorium. No matter what anybody tells you, that is not true. You can convert thorium into another element, and then that element can do it. But if you can convert thorium into another element, you can make a, a much better, easier, and safer to handle and build bomb with the traditional materials. In fact, the probability of a human being surviving the process of trying to make a nuclear weapon from uh, uh, converted thorium is super low. Like, you will die in the process. Anyway, so 
no matter what anybody says, when they say thorium is, is a proliferation issue, that is a silly non-starter. But the problem is, what happened is, um, thorium essentially was defined at very, very low levels to be source material. And so in the real world where people were mining for rare earths, or not mining for rare earths, maybe mining for something else, 40% of the world's rare earths came from thorium-heavy mineralizations that were a byproduct of some other mined commodity. So if you were mining for zircon or titanium, you would also get for free this mineralization called monazite. And monazite is a beautiful mineral. It's a phosphate mineral, and it has it usually runs at about 50% rare earths. It typically has all the heavy rare earths that you need, but it tends to have a, a lot of thorium, like from 3% to 14%. In fact, there it can go quite a bit higher. So what happens is, as soon as you mine for titanium and pull your titanium away, the residual under the regulation is in fact source material. It's the same as if you have plutonium in your garage, right? Black helicopter guys are showing up, right? So, um, so nobody could deal with this anymore. So what happens is 40% uh, of the rare earths that are being produced as a no-cost byproduct are shut off. Worse yet, that's where the world got 100% of its heavy rare earths. Entire supply chain ends, right? This is the 10 CFR 40, part 75, uh, and this is where all the trouble came from. And um, so I think I said this just to avoid the liabilities, cost, and financial risks associated with holding, storing, managing source material. The, the, the value chain in all of those countries expired. And where did it go to? OK, question, where did it go to? There you go. Look at that. 1980 seems to be a change in the dynamics on that graph. I don't know. So that, in fact, is the single biggest uh, issue. And along with this shift came the shift in the entire downstream value chain. And it was entirely voluntary. Because when somebody got the material that had the thorium, had the heavy rare earths, and it had to be processed, you certainly didn't want to do it here, and they certainly didn't care there. So all of the US, Japanese, and French companies transferred their technology to China. They will now tell you it was stolen, but that is simply not true. It was transferred. And China uh, understood this very early. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the father of the rare earth industry, I forgot his name right now, was a U.S. educated engineer from Drexel who went back and told Deng Xiaoping that the entire future is in these metals. And uh, you can see from the previous slide the investments they made in, in research at the national level. You can see that the literally it would be like the president of the United States having a huge investment in an industry. Deng Xiaoping's family owned MagnaQuench, which was one of only two patent holders in the world for the NEFEB magnet, the one you use in weapon systems, the one you use in commercial products, your phones, uh, and, and it was transferred to him. Our government let that go. Um, I won't even get into the rest of the story because there's a bad part that nobody needs to hear. Anyway, this is what happened. Uh, this is how it happened so fast. Once again, Cold War policies, bad decisions, uh, you know, unintended consequences from uh, regulations that were intended to make the world safe for, from proliferating materials. Remember, in 1980, the rare earth magnet hadn't been invented yet. So the people that changed the, the definition of, of source material couldn't have anticipated how big this blunder is. But this is the nature of unintended consequences, right? So why does it matter? So China uses access to these materials uh, to force manufacturing and IP into their country. Um, in fact, their stranglehold is so strong that it is a completely reasonable statement to say that 
all current and future advantages from any uh, application or material science discoveries that require these materials, all of that advantage will go to China. So if our national labs figure out a new application or a new uh, metallurgy for rare earths under the current paradigm, our national lab is essentially subsidizing the Chinese economy and not our own. This is how serious it is. Um, another thing that is super incredible uh, in terms of leverage is that China can simply withhold these materials uh, uh, or, or force the, the technology and manufacturing away from its adversarial countries, essentially robbing the cultivating environment of, of innovation, right? If you live in a country where they're not making iPhones, you're not going to make a lot of advancements in iPhones. But if you're the country that makes almost all the world's iPhones, you're going to be right there at the cutting edge. So anyway, I got to move along. You guys get it. Some other really insignificant things, like here's where China is leading in uh, defense weapon systems that are 100% uh, dependent on these materials. No big deal. Quantum computing, kinetic weapons, uh, um, hypersonic weapons, directed energy weapons, um, uh, nuclear uh, uh, propulsion. Uh, I mean, the applications here are incredible. Um, how does this play out in the real world? Um, <laughs> the nicest way to say it is China has the ability to moderate its adversarial uh, 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 countries' economies to moderate. And they have disproportionately moderated ours. I will give you the best example. The, the same year that the iPhone was introduced, let me back up. Apple had no choice. They had to manufacture in China because it was the only way to get access to these materials because they're abundant in a, in a smartphone iPhone. So China goes to, uh, Apple goes to China to manufacture these phones. The same year that they built, in, introduced and built their first iPhone for the world to see, before that year was over, a little company nobody would hear of and could never become a problem later in the future, a little company called Huawei, introduced a knockoff. Same year. There's more technology in that iPhone than we had to put a man on the moon. They did it in less than a year. How do they do it in less than a year? You want to make something in China? You literally had to hand the country your IP and your construction plans for your facility, everything. So when Apple started building their uh, factory on Monday, China started building theirs on Tuesday, and that's how it went down, right? So uh, what you, you fast forward today, uh, if you believe the people on the news, they will tell you that Huawei is this evil, dangerous corporation that threatens US security. Well, how did that happen? How did that company leap that far that fast because they were moderating us. They were, they were using these critical materials to capture IP, to leap forward. They're very, very powerful. So um, what are the obstacles? One big obstacle is the thorium issue. Uh, I've been working with three administrations, Congress and the Pentagon, uh, to solve this issue, uh, making very little traction. We're still working on it. Um, and um, uh, there's, uh, there's some legislation uh, in Congress right now for a production tax credit, which we very strongly support. It's in the House and in the Senate. Um, it's uh, The House version is H.R. 5033. It's a production tax credit for the uh, domestic domestic manufacturing of rare earth magnets. Uh, it certainly doesn't answer the question of how do you compete with China when you have to pay full price for your, your capital, and then you have to somehow squeeze a return out and satisfy the infinite appetite of investors. When you're competing with a country that has 
um, not direct tax subsidies built into the value chain and indirect subsidies like no cost of capital, no investor return, uh, uh, cheaper labor, it's, it's mathematically impossible. So that's just rare earths. And the story is true for all the other critical materials. Uh, remember, these materials have no significant economic or application value in their mind. Everything is downstream. So let's take a little boat ride downstream. What does it look like? It looks like this over and over and over again. Doesn't matter who's mining it. Only thing that matters is who's refining it or turning it into metals or making it application ready. And in case the screen is not big enough, the red bars are China and those are all the downstream applications. Just, a, oh, just another way to look at it. You can see they're very low on the mining side, but when it comes to the application, you know, the refining side, the application ready side, that's China. Um, so you look at uh, uh, lithium as a critical material and you see where that game is playing out. Let's look at it a little closer. Let's look at where America stands versus China and the rest of the world. Those are really small numbers. And those numbers, you know, you, you, when you see this 10% number when you get down to the fully constructed battery, that's because essentially we're assembling Chinese stuff. So that, that's a phantom number. Okay, we're going to catch up, right? I don't think so because this is current and planned. There's no winning that race. That's a skateboard versus a dragster. Okay, here you go. Look at lithium, look at cathodes, look at the rate at which they're making new investment. By the way, capacity exceeding demand. Again, look at the rate at which they're controlling the downstream side of things. Again, quote of the day. There's not a, there is not a solar panel you can buy in this country today that is not suspect for being, having Chinese origin parts. Same thing for tungsten, same thing for other super high tech metals like rhenium. Um, and I gotta stop. There are more slides for you guys, but uh, I gotta stop for some questions. So folks, if you're watching on if you're watching online, uh, you should be able to see the screen. Um, if you're not seeing the screen and you're not seeing a link to to submit questions, t try to toggle your device. Uh, you, you're 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 basically getting two feeds. You're getting the in, inside the auditorium feed and the slides. So if you're not seeing a link to submit questions, you're not seeing the slides. Try to toggle your device. Uh, I'm sure we got lots of questions. I'm going to kick things off. Uh, so let me play devil's advocate here. So. I'm sure there are lots of critical uh, um, production processes where we could flash and show that one country has a dominant role in that market, right? Um, we're moving to now an economy where we have diversified to some extent. We are less reliant on oil. We're now reliant on electricity, right? Um, that electricity is going to require lots of different pieces. And so in some respects, we've diversified, right? We're not relying on one piece. There's probably something out there that the U.S. is producing or that they could produce uh, that would level the playing field a bit, right? So if they hold back rare earths, there's something else we're producing that we can hold back because there's so many things that go into this, these production processes. So your last slide made it clear, we're not going to catch up. So why try to run that race when we could just be looking for other things where we have our comparative advantage, right? Wow. Um, so this is, there is a fundamental problem in the way we measure economic value. And the way we measure economic value is entirely private. And that is all through the mechanism of shareholder value, which means everything that giant corporations do is for some shareholder who may own the stock for five years, five minutes, or five seconds, mostly five seconds, by the way. And to address that directly, formerly, the largest export of the United States was aircraft. I say formerly because we're nowhere near that now. 
Now we're exporting food, right? To who? So what's going on with airplanes? Well, the geniuses at Boeing decided they weren't manufacturing anymore. They were in the IP business, right? And so what they have done is they've transferred away their technology domestically to diverse groups that don't know what the other part of the piece of the puzzle is doing to manufacture aircraft and the results are horrible, right? We've all seen that. But at the same time, they transferred all of that same technology to China where China is now being taught by Boeing how to build complete airframes. And so there is your problem. Where we could win, we lose, right? Another example uh, of that defensive strategy is withholding semiconductor chips that another country makes from China. And that is not going to work out well for us because all that does is make China move faster down that road. And they will be independent of those Taiwanese chips in a very short time, or they'll just have Taiwan. We are playing checkers, and they're playing three-dimensional chess. This is the difference. I read a book recently, and they described the way uh, um, um, European Americans think, and certainly the Pentagon. And we, we think in a straight line. We only think this happens, then this happens, and this happens, and this. This is our thinking. And if there is a, if they, it's, if there's a monetary value to it, nobody cares about the tenth iteration. They only care about the next iteration. Now, so what we have is vertical thinking. And the Chinese, it was described in this book, have lateral thinking. And first you think, oh, you know, it's semantics. No, it's not semantics at all. It's quite clever. Um, every, every step redefines the next move. And if you think I'm exaggerating, there's a famous quote by Deng Xiaoping when he was finally being recognized for the incredible genius that he was. And they said to him, uh, how did you know what to do next? How did you know all of those moves? And he literally, the translation is this. When I stepped into the river, I didn't know what step was next. I just felt around for the rocks and took the next step. That's the lateral thinking. And I can tell you from my many engagements with the Pentagon, there is no lateral thinking in that organization. And uh, that tends to be true for members of Congress because everything is a two-year or six-year cycle. And it's just as bad at the administrative level, the executive level, because everything is on a four-year cycle. So our political system and our financial system make long-term lateral thinking literally an impossibility. And so what happens is we need to fit, we need to be honest, assess the situation we're in, and make big boy, big girl decisions and start thinking differently. Because every move that we made that put us in this position was, was defined by the financial ethics that were defined by Milton Friedman in the Chicago School of Economics and the Boston Consulting Group. They followed the prescribed model. And the prescribed model is, if I can make this for a dollar here and sell it for $2, and I can make it for one cent in China, I'm going to make it in China. And that's what they did. Nobody moved their manufacturing to China to be profitable, more, to, to stay in business. They moved there to be more profitable. And more profitable for who? The elusive shareholder, right? And the shareholder, by the way, changes every day, every minute, and every second. Literally, if you're a head of a corporation, you answer to a shareholder who may buy your stock and literally hold it for a microsecond but has an absolute, what he believes, uh, um, you have an obligation to deliver him a return. And when you're trying to deliver returns that exceed the natural organic growth of anything, business, profits, the population you're selling to, 
double digit profitability is not sustainable unless you're essentially selling and, and, and uh, um, shorting your future. And that's essentially the transfer that occurred. So I'm sorry I wasted so much time, not wasted, but spent so much time on a simple question, but there is no simple answer. So we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on the thorium regulations, thinking about, well, wait a minute, that would free up our rare earths and also thorium. Yep. So what about the thorium? I spent 15 years working on that. Uh, I went to the Pentagon in 2009 and put a plan in front of them that would terminate, literally terminate China's monopoly in rare earths, solving that problem and others. And um, my uh, uh, wardrobe was not to their liking. Apparently, I didn't have a Versace suit on and I didn't represent Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan who were selling a, uh, a con job called Molly Corp that was holding out that it could solve all of America's problems when in fact it was geochemically impossible. So they bought the fraud and they ran that fraud for 10 years. And when that fraud went bankrupt, guess what happens? Venture capital guys come in and buy that same asset, go to the Pentagon, tell the exact same story. And what do you think they did? They bought it. They bought the exact same story. Nothing's changed. No, in fact, it's, something has changed. China's involvement in the first round was undetectable. China's inv direct involvement in the second round in the new incarnation of MP materials is, in fact, foundational. So uh, there are solutions to this. Um, our solutions were very uh, much opposed by the Pentagon because the Pentagon was protecting its constituency, which is the defense industry, and the defense industry was very concerned about upsetting China and losing access to these materials because they were all violating the law, building weapon systems based on illegal, well, technically not illegal, because they had changed the law. So what they were doing was smoke and mirrors, a whole other story. But yeah, there is a solution. There was a solution. It was also opposed by the same people that ran the Mali Corp, uh, business, the same people who run MP, the people who run Linus, the people who run Avalon, the people. So essentially, nobody in the rare earth space was interested in a solution that would result in incredibly abundant and uninterruptible rare earths because their models were built on high prices and shortages. So, no pleasing answer anyway. Uh, so, my question is. Uh, do all are all rare earths found with special crystal structures that have thorium in it? And is that true for does just China have a special kind of ore? And what role does Tibet play in this? What role does who play in it? Tibet, Tibet in uh, the plateau. Oh, so uh, round one, uh, there are exceptions to thorium. Those are called ionic clays. Uh, the process for extracting rare earths from ionic clays can only happen in the most abysmal of countries. Even China has discontinued the process. Uh, ionic clays contain heavy rare earths and literally no thorium, but the extraction process is to essentially get a giant garden hose of weak acid and melt away entire landscapes. That's what they're doing now in Myanmar. Um, so there are exceptions. But China doesn't care about thorium anyway because they are an a, a observer to the IAEA. They are not a member, so they can do whatever they want. Uh, so storing thorium is perfectly safe. It's nothing like uranium or plutonium because it's not water soluble and it's got one natural isotope and it doesn't do anything and your body doesn't recognize it anyway. So it doesn't, you know, if you read the, uh, the Radium Girls, the book, you know, your body doesn't think it's calcium and loaded in your bones. Your body passes it. So anyway, uh, and then the third question, Tibet, eh, just one more place to squeeze. Is it particularly interesting for rare earths? No. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's, it's not significant. Myanmar, uh, everywhere in Africa um, uh, are places that they're interested in. 
they have a little mine operating in the West Coast in California that supplies them, which the Pentagon funded. Um, so, yeah, I mean, all they care about is getting resources. Um, you've done a wonderful job laying out all of the infrastructure decisions they've made and how complete their monopoly is. So my question to you, and you've kind of alluded a little bit to policy changes, is two part. One, how do you get a largely individualistic society like the US to compete against a society that is universally on the same page, whether they like it or not? Yep. And two, do you still have faith in this policy solution that you proposed against all of the infrastructure that is now in place in China currently. Wow. First of all, uh, your first part of your statement is a, a, a fundamental issue. The American independence, right? Uh, you know, we're all gunslingers and we're all independent and we all, that is a problem when you have a communal issue, right? The United States dealt with those problems early. They formed things called cooperatives because all the farmers were starving to death. Grow your food and you die of starvation. You know, so, so the United States has got different boxes with different tools. The problem is ideologically and politically, um, uh, the, 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 um, the, the thought process or the act of polit all political action is now, uh, f uh, fixed to Milton Friedman, Chicago School, economic, thought. And that thought is everything is independent and the government should do nothing. And if the government has anything, they should immediately find a private person and hand it to them so they can make enormous profits off of it. So for example, every five years, they're trying to sell the TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, which is a miracle. And one day they will. And we'll, everybody will suffer because you won't have industrial energy for four cents anymore, which means every steel mill will close down. And every automobile facility will close down. You ask yourself, why aren't they in Detroit anymore? Because TVA is here, and TVA provides that kind of energy. So first part of your question is, yes, fundamentally, Americans have a problem thinking collectively and acting collectively. Right? Politically, it's much worse because their thought process is boiled down to, to a limited set of actions that project a very limited and, and, and unsophisticated uh, dogmatic belief system. So that's problem one. Can it be fixed? So as I said, uh, uh, 15 years ago, we gave them a perfectly workable plan that absolutely undeniably would have terminated China's monopoly. Uh, individual actors uh, pursuing their own, their self-interest, greed, which was mostly in the form of defrauding shareholders, uh, prevailed. And they were able to convince the Pentagon, members of Congress, and people active in various administrations that you don't want to go down the road of solving the thorium problem because that would unleash tremendous amounts of rare earths that would go into the market. And consequently, our investment, uh, our, our stock would be worthless. So they won out. So again, it goes back to that fundamental problem of who benefits. Uh, it's getting really bad. It's getting super painful. And this administration has set objectives and made commitments that are so far out of reach that there is a level of desperation that they may just do the right thing, but certainly not for the right reason. We have legislation uh, that exists that helps. There's this, uh, this production tax credit. We have another bill that we're working with uh, bipartisan House and Senate members with to fix the thorium problem. If we get both of those uh, uh, into a vehicle and passed, we are halfway there. The other half is that you still need capital. You still need $3 billion to build that facility. And the way it works in America, that's high risk money and they want infinite returns. Right? Go ask a venture capital person what their real, their honest internal uh, uh, return requirements are for an investment. It's not 20%. It's not 100%. It's 500%. 
a thousand percent. They make a lot of bets. Most of them don't go. So the ones that go have to have incredibly large returns. So how do you compete against the country that's selling stuff below production cost and give a return to the investors? Well, that's impossible. So there's another part to the equation. Um, we, and then there's a third part. Until you fix the thorium problem, you, you're not going to have your terbium and dysprosium, which means you can't make the high temperature magnets, which means that uh, the only magnets you're making are essentially curiosities that have very minimal commercial value. So it's super complicated. Um, I actually am working uh, with a number of proven commercial scale uh, um, uh, companies that have c capabilities in all of the areas. Uh, we've lined up everybody except the last player who is currently uh, in an acquisition, so they can't have a conversation with us, and that's been going on for over a year. And until we have that conversation, uh, we can't uh, um, sell that the project to investors and or the government. And as the clock ticks away, um, it gets really much more difficult. So, but we have we actually have a plan with a certain amount of government money and the tax credits. Uh, we could build a a economically competitive. Um, uh, system in the United States. Now, of course, China controls price, so China could essentially just drop price below that level, but because of the tax credits that are built in, uh, you it, even that is it literally, it, it, they can't do it. The tax credit is sufficient, so even under the worst circumstances where China essentially tries to crash you as a competitor, uh, if we get the legislation we're asking for, we could build a company that could do it because we actually have a resource that has the terbium and dysprosium and just magically happens to have thorium below those regulatory levels. It's the only, it's only, the only permitted deposit not under China's control in the, in the whole world. Yeah, thank you very much for um, a great talk and thank you to the Baker Center for, for hosting this talk. Um, I'm wondering if there is a role for the World Trade Organization to step in and actually help with this issue, since you're talking about subsidies, which are probably illegal under World Trade Rules. They are rules. very clever. They are very clever. <laughs> the way they do them, they're technically legal. And if um, the World Trade Organization itself does not step in, why does the United States not draw on anti-dumping duties to discipline China's exports and rare earths? Uh, there's a lot of conflicts going on. Um, first off, if you successfully step in, you may not have rare earth magnets for your F-35. It's a problem. Uh, secondly, even all subsidies removed, they have soft subsidies, which again is the no cost of capital, so what if the government's bad at investing? So what if they never make their money back when they build a $3 billion factory? Oh, they're just, our government does it every day, right? So it's pretty hard to call them on that. Maybe you can turn off the hard subsidy, which is a 13% VAT tax rebate. That's not the big problem. The big problem is this, the soft subsidies, the zero cost and zero return on capital, cheaper labor, China using its one belt, one road system to lock suppliers in, you know, um, so, so those aren't easy wins. I'll tell you the last time the WTO was called into this fight, how it worked out for us. Uh, I was going around Capitol Hill, talking to all these folks, telling them that, uh, that strategy was not going to be helpful. And no, no matter how it went with the WTO, China was going to win. Lo and behold, China lost but China won. How did China lose and China win? Well, they went in and they said, you have to quit restricting supply. China was holding back supply, keeping prices unnaturally high. US and Australian rare earth mining companies, business models were built on this e-pricey, right? They, un they unload the floodgates, which we told them they were going to do. Prices collapsed below break even, and they successfully bankrupt Mali Corp, and Linus only survived through massive government subsidies, transfers, and the uh, forgiveness of debt. Uh, technically, they were 
should have been bankrupt also. They barely survived, you know. Um, so uh, using the WTO as a tool against China, they have probably thought all the angles out and your win is probably your loss. Just like that example, which was entirely predictable, but everybody imagined that those were real rare earth prices. Silly, isn't it? If you control supply, you control price. Especially if you control supply, you control price, and you're the biggest consumer. You say what price is. And that's the sludge hammer they've got holding over everybody. And that's why it's so hard to get downstream investment. Because the further you go downstream, the lower the, pro uh, the, the probability of survival is. I mean, you know, the announcement by MP Materials that they were going to get into the magnet business should have told every investor to get out. Because mathematically, they can't make magnets and make money against China without subsidies. And then there's the geochemistry problem where they can't make the expensive, important magnets. So all they would do is essentially make uh, uh, rare earth magnets so for your electric vehicle so you can move your seat back and forth. You can adjust your mirror. That's all those magnets are good for. You can't use them in brakes. You can't use them in motors. You can't use them anywhere that's important. So the fact that, that they're going to go into a space where their competitor is highly subsidized and they can never meet those costs is a problem. They can't make the magnets that people need. That's a problem. And most importantly, as we discussed earlier in some other meetings, if you can't prove to the the OEM off-taker, the buyer, the consumer of those magnets, if you can't demonstrate beyond any doubt that you are a reliable, uninterruptible producer of magnets, no one is going to switch over to you. Absolutely no one is going to switch to you. Why? Because China's reputation for retribution in this space is unparalleled. Literally, defense contractors are scared to death of China on this issue. And it only gets worse if you're an automobile maker or you're an iPhone maker. No one can make a high temperature magnet without China providing them the, the separated terbium and dysprosium. And most of them also need to buy separated praseodymium and neodymium so that they can get the chemistry right. So at the end of the day, there's, you know, building, opening a mine benefits China because now you essentially are going to be selling to China. You're going to be supplying China. Opening a magnet factory isn't going to do any good because except for some pointless virtue signaling and meaningless supply contracts, no big uh, important company technology or application is going to switch over to you as a supplier. It's suicide. What values do you... Um stand for as a society what's that what's the size of the subsidy no sorry what kind of cultural values do you advocate for cultural values. uh wow uh i have two daughters and i want them to grow up in a world where they can have a place in the world and have dignity in the world right a world that doesn't offer people dignity is a cruel world and by the way that's the world we live in today right people are living under bridges Kids are giving up early in life because they look into the future and they don't see a place for themselves. Everybody sitting in this room is an exception because of family, because of natural endowments, whatever. I believe in a world where everybody should be able to achieve dignity in an exchange for some value given. And that value is in proportion you know, to the dignity assigned. That means if you're a janitor, You're the best janitor and you're doing a great job. If you're a physicist, you're, you're contributing that. But it has to be give and take because I can promise you the, the, the new virtue in the world which we assign people value for nothing in exchange is the most undignified form of life there is. So, I, I, that, I mean, it's a, hard, it's a strange question for me because I don't think about that. I guess I do every day, but not in those... Not in the structure of that question, so I apologize. So we're going to call it and give Jim uh, a bit of a break. He's been running all morning. 